Good morning and welcome. I have a request before we get started. Can you imagine being on a panel about comedy and being on a panel about comedy from a place called Comedy Central? Like, it's not a requirement that you're funny to work at a place called Comedy Central. Like, that, that is a lot of pressure. And I feel that pressure on behalf of this panel today. Um, we're going to have a meaty conversation. I'm not funny, which is that, that I should make that clear. And my name is Jude O'Reilly, and I work at the Skoll Foundation, where I'm responsible for the Skoll Awards and the funding we do within the Skoll portfolio. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to this panel, funny or not. It's called Not Just for Laughs, How Comedy Sparks Change. Um, in this session, we'll hear from researchers, from comedy writers, and activists. They will share how they leverage humor to drive real and lasting change. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, Please silence your cell phones. Ray Suarez has this way of describing this. If your ringtone is a sign of your individuality and personal freedom, please put it on mute for the next 45 minutes. Um, please wait for the microphone before speaking. There are lots of folks out on the internets that want to hear your question too, and we want to make sure they do. We are filming the session, um, and that's another thing we want to make sure we preserve. This session is scheduled to end at 11.15. After the session, please take a few seconds to complete a session survey and hand it to your steward on the way out the door. It's, it's what helps us make these panels even better year after year. Delegate-led discussions start at 11.45 a.m. If you're attending a discussion, we recommend that you pick up a to-go lunch and take it with you to the discussion room. There will also be 30 minutes to eat after the discussions end. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Fenella Kernborn, who is head of curation at TEDx Sydney. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are we? We're enjoying Skoll. I think it's very good. Um, I'm going to introduce our panellists in just a moment here, but who here is a comedian in the room? Hands up. Okay, no hands. That's okay, cool. Who here works in social change? Great. Who here is a little bit freaked out by trying to incorporate comedy in your work? One. I love the honesty. I think it's great. <laughs> it's really, really good. So we're, we're, we're going to be talking about this stuff. So no matter where we are in the world, regardless of what it is that we do, what we know and what our panellists are going to be discussing today is, is the, 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 the social challenges that we face. Many of these can actually be addressed by really successful use of comedy and comedy writing and teaming up with the right people. It can address things like corruption and racism and extremism and all those <laughs> sorts of things. So we're going to be unpacking a whole bunch of these things uh, this morning and again as Jude kindly mentioned opening it up to your questions as well so we'll talk about social change and comedy hopefully it'll be a bit funny at times don't We're gonna have fun. work work at it all right yeah uh, and then and then we'll try and talk about some of those practical methods the how-to like what you can actually do which I think would be really super important um, so uh, without further ado uh, we won't go into too much detail um, I wanted to welcome to the stage three remarkable human beings who are embedded in this. This is their practice. So joining me is comedy writer from Israel, Omri Marcus. Round of applause for Omri. <laughs> um, Erica Soto Lam, who is from Comedy Central. Hello, welcome to you too. Thank you <laughs> And over there we have Katie Borum Chatu, who is the director of the Centre for Media and Social Impact, but most importantly has a book that's coming out uh, in January 2020 on this subject. Can you say the title of the book for me? Uh, a comedian and an activist walk into a bar, colon. <laughs> <laughs> the most important part. Uh, the serious role of comedy in social justice. Perfect. Welcome to you too. Well, well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a rolling conversation. We're going to be getting through a whole bunch of different things and also playing some clips as well um, that hopefully are funny too. But Katie, just to start off, I wanted to, to sort of get a bit of a framework about what we're talking about today. What, what do we know about how comedy actually works as persuasion, as influence in yeah. social issues? Yeah, so I'll try to set this up somewhat briefly. But um, the book actually derives out of really about um, five concentrated years of real study and practice around comedy and social justice. So my work uh, spans a lot of different areas, but, but I come by my comedy pedigree, honestly, because I was a producer for Norman Lear for a long time in Hollywood. He's a legendary comedy producer who sort of was the progenitor of the idea that social issues can be incorporated into comedy in a meaningful way through his shows in the 70s and 80s, and a lot of shows picked up to the mantle um, continuing to this day. And so um, at the center that I run, which is an innovation lab and a research center in Washington, DC, 
what we recognized was that um, I was working on a project that I won't go into detail about. It was actually a documentary about um, comedy and global development. And we realized in the course of that work that there was so much existing research about comedy and its interrogation of social issues. Comedy as a source of persuasion, also as a source of inspiration for civic practice. Uh, however, there, was, um, there were huge gaps in the research. There were questions that were not being addressed. And also, as a, as a strategist and social justice activist myself, the sort of profound realization was that even if any of you or you know, any, I'm using you as a surrogate for social change people, social justice leaders, if you wanted to leverage comedy, you might not know what that really meant. How would you do that? How, how does comedy work as persuasion? How does comedy work as a form of civic engagement and civic practice? So that led to our, to our research, and we wanted to answer a number of questions so that we could actually not just answer the questions, but inspire social justice leaders to actually um, use comedy. And so I'll just lay out a couple of things that we know from research. So first, we think of, and this is meaningful in a room like this, Comedy is adjacent to social justice because social justice, of course, is about seeing the status quo with a new lens in a new way. So comedy is a deviant, disruptive form of art and culture that provides both hope and optimism, a new way to see, brings people in, so it's a source of civic imagination, which is the term that we like to use, and it's also a really important so uh, form of social critique. This is particularly important when we have moments of uh, authoritarian regimes, which we'll talk about later. So what we know from research very briefly, um, we think about it in two ways, and we'll get into this for the whole panel. There are two levels to think about this. So comedy as a form of persuasion, so what happens to the audience? So I know I probably have behavior change people in the room, so this is sort of your language. But also there's the sociology of how comedy inspires civic practice and why activists may want to use it. So comedy is a source of persuasion. Uh, what we know from research, ours and others that we've synthesized in this book and other research projects, are that um, comedy allows a way into taboo topics. That should be really intuitive. Comedy offers a, so a source of hope and optimism in issues that we have predominantly portrayed as dire and hopeless. We understand that, but there has to be some light and a way in. Turns out from a behavior change perspective, attitude change, hope and optimism are actually motivating emotions. Um, there is also research that shows that comedy is a gateway to serious information. So what that means is that when we acquire serious, complex information about a civic or social issue through comedy, we actually pay closer attention to that issue over time through serious sources of information like journalism. So they're symbiotic in that way. Um, Comedy also works as persuasion through entertainment value and through positive emotions. So what that means... You mean that we, we laugh? Yes. Right. So that was just... Got, and I'll toss it back to the panel. <laughs> what that really means is that comedy as persuasion doesn't work through entirely a cognitive route, which is one form of persuasion. It works through an affective, emotional route, which is meaningful because what that really means is that if the comedy is not really funny, so if it's loaded down, if it's too messagey, it's actually not working in the way that comedy works as persuasion. So the big advance um, piece of information that we'll all talk about is that um, if social justice leaders and comedians are going to collaborate, there has to be real creative freedom and license given to the comedians. Mm. Um, to, to be entertaining. So that's just a little bit of what we know. Yeah, a, a big framework and a background to what it is that, that we're going to be discussing and hopefully you'll be able to answer some, ask some questions about this as well. Erica, you're at Comedy Central, but you're pretty new to this role. I am. So yeah, this thing can be misleading. <laughs> um, Make a joke, and, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pressure to be funny when you work for a brand like that. Mm. Uh, the truth is uh, that I come from the social justice and issue advocacy realm. And to Katie's points, uh, we tried comedy on for size and found it really effective. So uh, my background is in politics and in issues, and I was one of the founding team members at an organization called Every Town for Gun Safety and Moms Demand Action, which is one of the largest gun violence prevention organizations in the United States. Uh, so heavy issue, hot issue, very political. Um, and you know, we did the things that NGOs and advocacy organizations do. Um, it's actually an organization built out of um, Mike Bloomberg's uh, City Hall. So data was key. And we did all of the research reports and white papers and <coughs> polling. And that's all a really important 
uh, tools in the toolbox of how you get information out, how you educate people. Um, but it doesn't reach everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think comedy is a really important part of the culture tool that, you know, as we, if you went to the opening plenary, uh, Ai Jin Poo spoke about uh, Roma and narrative power as a way to bring more people in, uh, to help them understand the issues of domestic workers. And I think that there's so much great film, mm. um, and comedy is in its nascency. It's something uh, else in the toolbox so that you're we able did to that access. On guns. You mm. know, we were able to make these complex um, and frankly screwed up gun laws in the United States, call them out for yeah. that through comedy in a way. Tell, tell me one of those clips, describe something, the, the, the one with the mums with guns thing. Yes. It's actually a pretty good example we of did. how this might work. So we actually did exactly what Katie said. You know, we knew that we could, we, we, we wanted to leverage comedy to create uh, social change on guns. Um, but we also knew we weren't uh, comedians. So we partnered with uh, a gentleman who's a friend of all of ours. Uh, it's a small world, this comedy and social justice uh, mix, uh, named Mick Moore, uh, who, who has done tons of work in comedy. And he helped us write scripts for what eventually was called What Could Go Wrong. Mm. So the Americans might remember, and if you're not American, I apologize. You might be horrified that this was a thing that happened in our country. There's so many of them. <laughs> um, there was a trend a few years ago uh, with uh, gun extremists uh, making a point about the right to gun ownership in our country, um, Second Amendment rights, they have every right to go into the places where we eat and shop, Starbucks, Target, um, fully strapped. And I'm not talking about you know a, a handgun in a holster, I'm talking about uh, AR-15 assault weapons. Mm. So to make a point, they were going to get lattes at Starbucks with <laughs> fully strapped. And I think it was uh, a wake up call for us. Um, Moms Man Action is our grassroots chapter. So we have people all across the country and they were like, wait, whoa, whoa, this isn't, you, there's responsible gun ownership. Uh, and then there's this, and it's a cultural issue. So we used comedy to call it out. We worked with um, Rachel Dratch, who is uh, a well-known uh, part of the SNL cast, um, to play the role of a mom who you know, takes all of these precautions to take care of her children, and allergies, and don't forget your seatbelt. Um, <laughs> all the things that parents do to create safety for their children in our environments. And then, you know, the, the end is they go to what looks like a TGI Fridays, you know, a very family-friendly restaurant. And as they're, you know, putting in orders, making sure about allergies, there's, there's a table of guys who are strapped with assault weapons. And so it just called out into, you know, this really crisp and hilarious way of mm. this is not what we mean uh, by, you know, respecting, having respectful gun ownership in yeah. our country. And the, and the punchline was, we'll get our food to go. We should probably leave yeah. the restaurant, basically. And it, and it worked. <laughs> it worked, It wasn't yeah. just the comedy piece. It also helped us bring people in to, like, sign the petition mm. to tell corporate leaders. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we did was, you know, call your legislators. This was... Uh, take, tell the corporations where you spend your money that this isn't what you want to encounter. And in fact, Howard Schultz, the CEOs of Chipotle and Target, they did make policy changes and statements saying this is not uh, the environment that we want for our consumers. Mm, we want to do something about it. Uh, Omri, let's, let's meet you and what it is that you do, because it's a, a bit different. You're a comedy writer, you're based in Israel, but you also put on a conference that, actually a little bit about what Erica was saying, it's about having the right partners, so literally getting people in a room to collaborate. Tell me a bit about how, how that works for you. Well, uh, my, my background is comedy writing, and after that I got a scholarship to travel the world and learn television all around the world for a year. So I created a big network of comedy writers and comedy professionals and content people in general because we are all storytellers eventually. Mm. And in 2014, I had this dream to bring the best comedy writers in the world to Jerusalem, the funniest place on earth. <laughs> said, no one ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we've done, it was an amazing uh, experience because we sat around a table, 15 writers, leading writers from 15 countries, and we wrote a sketch together. And it was very powerful, and it was mind-blowing with all the insights that we got. Um, and since then, we are pretty much once a year meeting. Usually it's a different group of people uh, every year. And a few months ago, actually, two months ago, Katie and I were in uh, South By doing um, 
a panel about um, Donald Trump impersonators from around the world. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, as a tweet, we actually have the opening clip from that. that uh, okay, yeah, so, so there is something about the moment that does lend itself to comedy and Donald Trump impersonators. So we do have a clip of, as, as uh, Omri said, of Donald Trump impersonators, which we'll have a look at. Just I think it's 15 about. Trumps in one minute. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Donald Trump. Eastbourne President, Sidonionic Stad of America. No one loves Ireland more than me with your bagpipes and your haggis puddings. Yum, 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 yum. First of all, I want to say I love Africa. I do. We had the best cake. It was so moist. So, so moist. These are medieval times. So what we need is a medieval president. Vladimir Putin, and it is theater with a night but at the end of my sentences, I'm just gonna clench my mouth. This is true, they elected a feminist government! Wrong, wrong. People of Israel, happy Independence Day from your good friend, America. I know you what, the media is hugely corrupt, but we've got huge problems. Seriously, big problems. Mr. Putin, Anglisky, Namspaya. And may God bless the United States of Trump. Thank you. There you go. What was that with the grey hair, the grey wig? I'm confused about that one. You know, I had to call, uh, when I called him and I needed a translator and I asked him, why is that with the grey wig? And he's like, isn't it grey? Mm. I was like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do we all look the same to you? Okay. No, fine. <laughs> um, could we talk more broadly about what it is about the moment that is enabling comedians, comedy writers, uh, and also those working in social entrepreneurship, social change, social justice, to, to meet at the moment, to start talking about these issues? I mean, and the Trump clip is a good way of kind of leading into that. Katie, what is, what is it about now that is allowing this, this sort of next level of communication to start to be more uh, prevalent? Yeah, so um, that's a great question, Fenella. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciated that a lot. <laughs> we all hung out yesterday, so this would feel natural. <laughs> also, we like each other. It turns out. Um, well, yes, this is a really, it's a really important question. And so uh, I won't go into a deep history, but there was a moment in comedy in the United States that actually felt very similar to this one in the 1960s. And this is important for a couple of different reasons. A, the media landscape had just changed dramatically. It was the infancy years of television, and uh, producers were looking for um, what was going to stick on TV. It turns out comedy was pretty hot. There was always alternative comedy in clubs and records. That's where the socially conscious comedy started to come up. Um, and at the same time, we had social justice activism. So those ideas came together, filling a new media marketplace and activism came together. So we're witnessing and are in the midst of, as you all know, a moment that is transformative in a different way, but has a lot of parallels. And so this particular moment is not, uh, does not occur in a cultural vacuum. It's actually incredibly important to acknowledge that what we're in, of course, is the uh, participatory networked era where um, access to making comedy is opened up and democratized in ways that are pretty dramatic. Um, so as a quick example, um, a lot of the comedians that I write about in my book are, are comedians who are now winning big awards and are on big mainstream shows like Hassan Minaj, who's um, created the Patriot Act, which just was nominated for a Peabody Award two days ago. Hassan Minaj is a YouTube-created comedian, and this is really important. He is uh, a person of color in the United States talking about an immigrant experience and what his life is like. So at the same time, we have these new voices, the marketplace in entertainment and in comedy is changing and shifting and opening up for marginalized voices who weren't previously there, because Hollywood does understand a market when it sees one. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that we know that activism has changed. So when we think about comedy at this moment, it's not just comedy in the marketplace. It's also short form comedy, like the kind of work Erica just talked about, that was created for activists. And you know, we have a lot of examples of, that we write about and talk about. Um, 
where that work is self-produced self by professional comedy people. So for both of those things to be true is really uh, relevant, and that's different than this conversation even would have been six years ago, actually. Mm. We're really talking about something fresh. Mm. And, and, and the one thing that I'll say, just as sort of the commercial for use comedy, uh, which is that um, young activists we've noticed organically understand that comedy and culture is part of what they should be using because they are digital natives in that way and they're also um, entertainment native, digital entertainment natives in a different kind of way than those of us who are Gen X and older. Um, so this is important to keep in mind because comedy, what led to all of our work and, and my friendship and collaboration with these guys is um, a recognition that uh, the social justice community was dramatically underutilizing comedy, and it's a really strategic tool. Mm. So, so how? Just, let's just unpack that a bit. How is the social justice community actually dramatically under, underusing comedy? Erica, what's your perspective, and, and Omri as well? Let's try and understand what's actually happening at the core. Yeah, I would also say that comedy has uh, too often just been about the punchline yeah. and not gone further into the education uh, and uh, engagement that can equip the audience into creating change. Now, I'm not advocating that this be, you know, you beat people over the head and we turn Comedy Central into a social justice network or that it, it'll feel like an after school special. Uh, <laughs> I think it needs to be really strategic and thoughtful. Um, but that the comedy is a medium to get people to see the absurdity of uh, the social problems that we are living through. Mm. I actually think now would be a good time to cue the second video, which is um, Amy Schumer, yes. who's a well-known comedian and who just takes on so many issues. This one uh, covers a couple, but you have to watch till the end to, to see how uh, she covers it okay, more Amy than Schumer. one. <laughs> so good, right? Like, so, so powerful good. to help us see the hoops that we have to jump through mm. in repro women's reproductive rights, and yet, you want a gun? Here you go. Yeah. You know, and so she, in I think that was a minute, uh, really powerfully expressed uh, on two really important social issues in in the United States. Uh, what's profoundly wrong. Mm. And so, you know, that's such a great entry point for somebody who worked uh, in gun safety, who also has an interest in reproductive rights that we can use, that we can leverage. And so she did that on her own. Mm -hmm. uh, later, a couple of years later, there was an unfortunate uh, shooting in, at the premiere of Amy's movie, Train, Trainwrecked. And so she became an even more forceful advocate for using comedy. She had a, a sketch show on, and she devoted one of the episodes in the series entirely to gun safety. And so there are a dozen great sketch comedy clips from her that all led people into taking action to create the country that we want. Mm -hmm. that it's, I mean, it's also interesting because I mean, you, Comedy Central is a you know, it's a, it's a you know, big network, and as sort of following on what, from what Katie was saying, it's a, it's at that moment when all of these other voices are, have had access, or they're providing themselves access through different types of technology. So, can talk a bit about how Comedy Central and other places, and Omri, please, you know, pipe in here too, are actually going. You know, this is the moment where we need to start thinking and yep. looking outside of the box a little bit, and that's actually changing the way that these platforms are working themselves. Right, so I'm in a new role. I've been there for about six months. Uh, Comedy Central has never employed somebody uh, from the social justice world before to figure out how to accelerate the possibility of using comedy for social change. Uh, and one of the things that I'm really excited about, and I'm working in partnership uh, with Katie and Mick Moore, who I mentioned earlier, uh, it's called the Yes and Laughter Lab, which is y'all, also known as y'all. <laughs> I like saying that. Y'all. Uh, good, good acronym. Um, and it's what it is is a uh, first time convening and collaboration between funny people and social justice people. Mm, mm. That's not to say that they are mutually exclusive because you can be funny and care about social issues and you can care about social issues and have a really great sense of humor, but that we hadn't had a room and a space yet 
to pull people together and figure out how do we make this work? How do we do more of uh, you know, what Amy Schumer did, does on her own and so many other comedians do on their own? And so we, we essentially have done a call for applications. This is the first year. Uh, it's a bit of a test case. And you, know, you never know what's going to work. You asked earlier, why now? Well, why not now? Yeah. Let's throw everything on the wall and see what <laughs> sticks. And early in the process, you know, we thought, Katie can attest to this, we're like, we really want to get 100 applications yeah. in. 50. Uh, yeah, we wanted to get a good number so we could pick. We're going to pick five uh, to come into a room that will be filled with philanthropists and NGOs and comedy brands uh, to hear the pitch mm. and then figure out how do we make those, some of those things happen. Um, so there's basically a thirst for this to happen. So it's the, not the, just... the end is that there were 500. Yeah. Five, way months. more than we expected. So there's energy there that just needs to be harnessed mm -hmm. and pulled into creating social change across all of the issues. So there, there needs to be the space to, to open it up for collaboration. Um, we, tell me a little bit about what, what your observations about, I mean, you work in the comedy world, you're a writer, you know, this is, yeah, this is what I'm you do. Not, my day job is not related. I'm, <laughs> I'm working for this company that is doing game shows in India, but basically what we are doing, <laughs> Uh, no, but it's, it is a part of that because we are all storytellers, as said, and um, the technology is making the best opportunity that was ever we were ever facing to do a comedy on a huge scale with very limited resources. Mm -hmm. So I, I can give you an example. Right after the American elections and the poor Brexit, uh, we were all very depressed. All this, our community was very depressed. So we, we decided to meet in London and we locked ourselves in a room for 72 hours. Uh, 15 writers from 15 countries and uh, an app developer and an app designer. Now, it's an intimate forum, so I can feel free to tell you what we've done there, but let's keep it here. We created an app called Pure DNA Test, which is the first app that using the sensor of your smartphone, that by licking the screen, <laughs> we can tell you your uh, genealogical uh, heritage. <laughs> so, people Try lick it. the screen, yeah, you can Everybody download it if, out, if you have a. Screens. An Android device, lick the screen, and uh, then it says calculating. And then, well, like the rest of the world, you're also from Africa, you phone licking idiot. Yeah. And the front camera was working, so you got a clip of yourself licking the screen like an idiot. <laughs> now, we only distributed that app uh, where Donald Trump won by a big margin. So I can tell you that we made 10,000 racist Americans to lick their smartphones. <laughs> I think made my point. Uh, so in this triangle of technology, comedy, and uh, bringing people from together, uh, there is a lot of power. And um, this is kind of like we are advocating for you to, to start using To start that power. doing it as well. So what, what, are the, what are the sort of the stopping blocks, Katie, that are, I mean, you know, not everybody's going to get together and get people to lick screens, for example, <laughs> although we can all try. This is one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I mean, I've been on several panels together. So yeah. you too could have a phone licking project. <laughs> That's what you should take away from this panel. Well, one thing, um, before I answer that really quickly, Vanilla, I wanted to add, um, the yes and laughter lab, y'all, um, which makes us laugh when we have internal calls. Like, hey, y'all, it never really gets that old. <laughs> it does. But sometimes it gets a little old. Um, but, uh, it's chuckles. Right? Yeah, it's chuckles. Chuckles. we're amused by it. I love yep. it. Um, one other point that I want to raise here is that we didn't create that project just because we thought it was a good idea. It actually came from research that what we were observing was that even if we had all this evidence for how comedy works as persuasion or informs civic practice, inspires civic practice, et cetera, et cetera, uh, these are two different sectors. You all know when you work across sectors, the organizational norms between you can often be the barrier for actually doing the work in a meaningful way. It's like this when we do storytelling work. Um, and so we thought we can't just have a convening where we tell people how this is a good idea, we're gonna make them work together. Mm. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit like the Good Pitch Project. If um, Jess Search is in the room, she's such a genius, created that project with um, Doc Society. It's a little bit similar to that idea. And the other thing that I think is important for this kind of group to know is that our other big observation is that, you know, comedy is a form of art and creativity and culture. We think of it as a form of commerce. But actually, it's a form. It's it's very self-made. It comes from passion. It comes from people who 
get the courage to often start on stage. Everybody starts as an amateur, almost never, you know, I mean, some people go get MFAs in screenwriting or whatever, but, um, and however, we have philanthropic sources of funding for almost every form of arts in the United States. It's still, you know, we, we need it uh, for um, visual arts, for documentary, uh, for uh, music, but we don't, largely speaking, have philanthropic sources of funding for comedy. Mm. And yet, again, strategic, important, artistic. So the only pipeline at the moment, generally speaking, to really create comedy that has a chance of succeeding in the marketplace is to depend on market forces. Now, if we believe in comedy in the social justice community, the philanthropic community, foundations and others should pay attention to that because mm. we, it's a form of art. But, and, and you know that it works, like you were talking about this yes. towards the start, the, the power of persuasion. We fund documentaries because they're super effective. That's right, but exactly, and the, and, the, and the way that comedy is actually able to reach people <clears throat> and, to get, and to get attention. And, and, and in, in particular, those that are actually only getting their sources of news from the late night TV shows in America, for example, who, or in Australia, it's kind of pretty similar. You might, you know, my niece who's 19 years old gets her news from Snapchat um, and comedy sources as well. So you, you, there's a market there that you need to be able to address at the moment and a, a level of distrust towards the, you know, the traditional news corporations as well. So how do we get around that? Is it just simply about trying to get people in social change to, to find better funders for it? What's the solutions, do you think, Erica? Well, I, I should have said I'm a sponsor of an idea that Katie and Mick had, right? That so you could say whatever you want. Getting getting to <laughs> see that there's an evolution that needs to happen in both the comedy world and the social justice world. And I'm lucky that I'm I'm in the mix of the, the nexus of the two. Um, but that that evolution from critique to change mm. is what I'm really hoping to fuel within the new space that I'm in, uh, to say, yes, we can be funny and we can change the world. And on the social justice side, you can say, yes, you can change the world and you can be funny. And so, you know, yes and, which if you've ever done improv, that's, the, that's one of the mechanisms for keeping the conversation going and continuing to be hilarious. Um, but I think it's a really relevant, uh, way to show people that we can, you can do both at the same time in mm. a really effective way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think documentary films, feature films, those are also really powerful tools, but you, know, you need the attention span for that as well. And the thing about this convergence of media and how everything is being disrupted, and your niece watching, <laughs> getting her information from Snapchat, is that uh, I think the appetite for content is, is shortening and coming in sound in, in bits and mm. snackable media and that comedy is primed and perfect for that so, um, the, so it, I'm excited to see more of that do you agree Omri yeah I mean it's uh, I couldn't agree more um, reality in this kind of chaotic reality that we are all living in I think comedy is breaking this chaotic reality to edible chunks so you can mm -hmm. digest and it's a very powerful tool I can say uh, from a personal perspective, um, I'm not sure, I guess you all heard we had uh, elections on Tuesday. This is why I got here late, because I had to vote. I was the first in line, I voted. And I, when I, the plan landed and I saw the devastating results, I couldn't ask for a better audience to kind of like to be around because I needed this kind of engagement and, and hope. But, um, and, and maybe a cuddle, do you think? A yeah. from time to time, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think that comedy would be a good tool for us to explain um, our message, our uh, non-extremist, non-racist message to, to the audience. It would be much more powerful. And this is kind of like my last hope that uh, we'll have to win ever elections. Mm. Um, so comedy is a very powerful tool for that. But not, not all comedians, I mean obviously this is pretty basic stuff here, but not all comedians see social change as something that they need to think about. Uh, and obviously not all social change uh, entrepreneurs, for example, are, are looking in the same way as well. So we, we talked a little bit about collaboration, but how do you get those two to, you know, to catch and hang out together and to start think differently? Um, Katie, what do you think? I think it's a little bit of, um, so I, I don't want to hang it completely on this idea of organizational norms and how sectors work differently, but that actually is really important. So. I've been give actually I spoke here four years ago when the fire happened. Is anybody else in that? Yeah. The ran right? <laughs> it's very memorable. Um, 
and I was speaking about comedy then, actually. And so I've been, you know, as the work has developed and we've created creative initiatives and there's a book coming out that came from all of that, um, I would give sort of variations of a talk like this where I'm like obviously a very enthusiastic uh, supporter of this idea and I, and I would give, you know, in, an, in a different kind of talk, I'm a, more of a professor, I'm trying not to do that to you this morning, it's way too early. Mm. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, I would give a lecture and explain like here at Comedy and Persuasion, show you experimental design research and storytelling genres and whatever, but, um, but then inevitably there would be a question at the end like, but comedy can go too far. I was like, oh my God, we have to move past that. I'm not saying that comedy works for every issue. Of course it doesn't. There is cultural competency. There, is, there are issues about the cultural sensitivity about particular forms of comedy, what's funny, what's not. All of that is true. Um, but, but to your question, Fenella, so we th it was just a really profound recognition. I guess this is also a little bit meta. I cannot persuade these people alone. Uh, let's create, I mean, the lab came from this and other creative mm. projects. Let's create spaces where we actually can work together creatively and actually, you know, the creative process in comedy, by the way, is really different. I've been working in arts and culture my, uh, most of my career and uh, produced documentaries. And, you know, it's like when you work with comedy writers, it's a whole different thing. There's like a space issue. There's, you, you know, you have to lock yourselves in a room yeah. for two days. There's pizza boxes. I know, I'm making you an archetype. <laughs> Just like you do. How much um, pizza? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> right? But, but no women is, allowed. They no, no right. That's <laughs> also, yeah. Um, so anyway, the, I, could be, I could be very long-winded, and I already have been, but, um, but to say <laughs> that um, we think there's a lot of promise in bringing sectors together to collaborate. And, and I want to say here, even though I said somewhat dramatically to be provocative, because it's early in the morning, somewhat provocative, I said it's underutilized. But for the groups that are using comedy, it's quite amazing. We write about them, I think. Um, uh, I Jen Poo, the amazing social justice leader who you all heard in the opening plenary, um, she's profiled in our book because she's using comedy for um, kind of training, spokesperson training. I'm grossly streamlining that. Um, so there, there are a lot of examples, and I think that as we highlight examples and as we have more of them, and hopefully with our lab, which also we're hoping to take around the world, so Omri will someday a part, be a partner in it. Um, what about me? I'm just kidding. And Sorry. you, Fanala, for sure you. <laughs> that just happened. Um, we hope there are just more examples. We need more projects to support and to study and to show real things happening with because this will become a generative story. And we'll have more case studies of how yes. it works. Well, that, yes. well, can we, can we actually try and work out how it works? Yeah, the, some understanding the case of it? Yep. study of uh, knowing that something ludicrous was happening on an issue and creating content that then yeah. drove people to us. I, another example from my, I'm putting on my different hats from the different work that I've done, but it, working in the gun violence prevention space, um, so I should say that the organization I worked for was tiny before the Sandy Hook shooting. It didn't mm -hmm. exist. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, probably a dozen people. It was more of a think tank, PAC, research entity. Um, but when the Sandy Hook shooting happened, we realized that that was a moment to build something new mm -hmm. uh, and really create a movement of Americans who will say they've had enough and it's time uh, to demand that our leaders take action on this problem. Um, Sandy Hook happened on a Friday morning and I was working for Mike Bloomberg and the phones just started ringing from all, from, you know, funders, from Hollywood, what can we do? Um, and one of my colleagues had the genius idea to just rent a soundstage, one, one in New York and one in LA, write a script. And we were able to, within a, a week, the next Friday, we released uh, a PSA that we, you know, we, we the space was probably donated. We didn't spend a penny on uh, having it viewed, but it Beyonce was in it. Like every, think of your favorite Hollywood actor, they were probably in it. Um, just cr And it, that helped to fuel p bringing people in. Mm. Now it wasn't particularly funny, but there were comedians in, in it, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, you know, just using the power of culture is, is how we were able to start a conversation and really build a movement around an issue. Mm. And I think that that's 
um, something that I want to help do over and over again on many issues mm. and, and, and where this is all coming from. Mm. And, and Omri, like it's, it's, uh, the other thing, of course, is knowing what you want to do. Like you want to know what your audience is, the kind of comedy that you want to produce. Like you, you, you even did a bit of a how-to guide to what comedy could be. That, uh, yeah. Can anybody be a comedian if you're in social change? Well, the oh. basic part yeah. is a craft and you can kind of like learn it, but it's basically you need the, the desire to do so and, and the collaboration with people that it's actually the work is the right way of doing that, mm. uh, which um, leads us to the question when comedy is going too far and um, then I can, uh, I mean, Katie will show a great uh, explanation, a, a great example yep. of when that happened. And the only two examples I have about from my work, I'm, I can't tell that on stage because I can't put that on record because <laughs> it's illegal in some countries. But I did use technology <laughs> to do a really nasty trolling to political uh, uh, the other side. Uh, okay. Very funny. You, you yeah. roasted someone quite, uh, quite well. Find me at the bar in the middle of the night. I might be drunk <laughs> enough to tell you. Yeah, lick his done. phone too. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's true. I mean, there are, a lot of people worry that they do, you can go too far. Um, but the question is, you need to understand what the question is that you're asking in the first place and, and who you want to talk to. So maybe this is a go good opportunity to play uh, this next clip and then we're going to open up to some of your questions as well. Um, but this, this clip, well, actually, Katie, I'll let you introduce it. Tell me about this clip. Sure, yeah. Um, so this was, uh, this, I thought this was a really meaningful example of a couple of different ideas. So, so far we've been talking about hope and optimism and ways to bring pe to people together, and that's true. But comedy also is a source of social critique, as we know. And, uh, and sometimes comedians can do things with social critique that often journalists can't do. So actually, that's really important to honor that piece of it. Um, so or won't do, actually. Or won't, yeah, yeah. or won't do, be, for whatever reason. But um, so in the, I guess the setup for this uh, is um, last year, we, in the United States, we have this event called the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, for many, many, many decades, um, I think six, 60 years or something, there's been a comedian who's been invited to be the sort of entertainer. And the comedian's job is to make fun of the room, you know, make fun of the president, Congress, the press, whatever. So Michelle Wolf, and by the way, it's a very infrequently been women, only a couple times, like Wanda Sykes, some other women, but largely has been men. So a comedian named Michelle Wolf was the comedian and uh, and you know she used some language um, and she said things but she said this piece at the end and this is what we're going to show you all where she calls out the press for their complicity in Trump now the press many of us have been following this for a while. This is now an open source of discussion a year and a half later and is a really important one. But she did it in a way, she was slightly ahead of time. And the way that the White House press corps attacked her and didn't, att didn't ever mention that clip, but said things like, she was mean to the press secretary. That was not the point of her comedy. Mm. So we're gonna show that piece um, just the last minute and then we can talk about that a little bit. And really, this is about <clears throat> comedy informs, and by the way, Donald Trump attacked her in the same way that reporters attacked her. So that's meaningful. Okay, let's have a look at the clip. There's a ton of news right now. A lot is going on, and we have all these 24-hour news networks. And we could be covering everything, but instead we're covering like three topics. Every hour it's Trump, Russia, Hillary, and a panel of four people that remind you why you don't go home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Milk comes from nuts now, all because of the gays. <laughs> you guys are obsessed with Trump. Did you used to date him? Because you pretend like you hate him, but I think you love him. <laughs> I think what no one in this room wants to admit is that Trump has helped all of you. He couldn't sell steaks or vodka or water or college or ties or Eric. <laughs> but he has helped you. He's helped you sell your papers and your books and your TV. You helped create this monster and now you're profiting off of him. And if you're gonna profit off of Trump, you should at least give him some money because he doesn't have any. <laughs> Trump is so broke, he grabs pussies because he thinks there might be loose change in them. 
All right, like an immigrant who was brought here by his parents and didn't do anything wrong. I gotta get the fuck out of here. Good night. <laughs> Clint still doesn't have clean water. The point here is saying, I mean, look, I didn't, I think she, I think Michelle Wolf is really talented and I wrote um, a piece the next day for a trade publication and said, you know, what we're getting wrong about this narrative about attacking her is that she actually said some of the most important mm -hmm. things that we need to be saying, which is how are we reporting on this guy? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in times of oppression and moments of uh, authoritarian, you know, whatever language we want to use, including in the United States, this is when we really need comedy to mm. speak truth to power, not yeah. just to bring us together. She set the media agenda for two weeks mm. based on that. Yeah. I mean, and there's a resonance, of course, it's an American-based thing, but it's a resonance for all, all of us around the world, from Australia yeah. to anywhere. So I think, I think it's, it's a great point in under, to understand it. So um, now it's time for you to pick their brains for their expertise and to ask some questions. So we're going to roam around with some microphones. Please wait for the microphone um, and, and we'll, we'll just keep this conversation going. So um, we'll start down here. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Is this on? No, not uh, yet. Not just yet. Keep talking. Is it on now? Yes. Yes. Hi. So I'm Barbara Van Dalen. I'm the president and founder of Given Hour and our focus is mental health. And also, and I went, this is a question um, about sort of different ways to use comedy and what you've experienced. And in addition to running the organization, I also have the great honor to be a consultant on an ABC television show called A Million Little Things. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting about that show is that it's tackling the ramifications, the ripple effects of suicide. And the writer who wrote the show, who's the creator, is a comedy writer. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did, DJ Nash, for years. He started stand-up. And then he experienced a suicide in his life, which is what led him to create the show. So in the show, the comedy is not around the suicide, mm. ever. Mm. Um, and so you have these really powerful emotional moments that are real and authentic, which is why they brought in a mental health person. But he's funny, and the characters are really funny. And what we're finding mm -hmm. is that the fans, they, it makes it more easy for them to mm -hmm. open up, to share about their own experiences online. He's funny online, you see mm -hmm. the back and forth. And I would, I'd like you just to comment on this continuum of how comedy in this way, it wouldn't be appropriate for the comedy to be about the tragedy, but around the character, it's, peripheral. it's yeah. incredibly yeah. powerful and helpful. Mm. I think Katie said it great. You said comedy is the gateway. Well, let's say comedy is the gateway drug, right? To yeah. get people in the door. Um, and I, you know, Barbara, you've called out a show that is really powerful and has found its ways to be funny about a, around a serious and difficult topic. Um, but I think that there can be more comedy also in the context of teaching people how to recognize the signs and symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, teaching, uh, creating the culture change around emotional health so that we treat it mm -hmm. in the same way that we treat physical health. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, comedy is another one of those tools to leverage in the context of creating culture change. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't sit in a role that is actually social change, social justice in an organization, but I sort of view myself, and I hope that there will be many more of me, uh, as like the in-house activist, mm. the in-house voice for social change mm -hmm. that can take us from creating culture change to uh, political and, and thought change that really changes um, policies and how we live and how we address issues like suicide. Mm. Well, can I add to that really quickly? So, um, so you raised something really important and I'll just add in here a, a little bit of nerdy business. It's important that we also keep in mind, and this isn't, this is for like media researchers for us to keep in mind and to incorporate this into our work, <coughs> that um, comedy is not a monolithic genre. And so uh, comedy is not all satirical news, of course. Comedy is stand up, comedy is episodic television, which is what you're talking about. Um, it's, uh, you know, short form, it's also sketch comedy. And so that's really meaningful because I think sometimes there's a tendency to think like, oh, it's all The Daily Show. Definitely not, and that's not the only thing we're talking about. So you raise something really important, which is that in episodic television, not just in comedy, we develop relationships with media characters that feel like real interactions to us, 
parasocial relationships, they feel like our real friends. So in episodic comedy, this is actually a really meaningful effect, which is that it humanizes issues and people who are portrayed as the other in other forms of information and journalism. And uh, suicide is a very stigmatized issue, and it's hard to talk about, and it's hard to you know, um, address with people um, around you, and so there is research that shows that as well. So I think mm. you're you're using it really well. You didn't even read the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. So we'll get your question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Connor Dimonioman, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Philanthropy University. Um, I also am a co-lecturer at Stanford Business School on a course called Humor Serious Business. Ooh. And so I want to be friends with all of you yeah. and talk with you and get your cards and hear about that crazy story where you offended some <laughs> dictator or whatever. At the bar. Uh, at the bar. 11 o'clock <laughs> tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The pub. Um, in a dark corner. <laughs> so one, one of the things we talk about in the, in the Stanford course is, is activating your funny, in particular for people who don't themselves consider themselves to be funny. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have any practical advice for people who don't think they're funny for where they can start in using Being humor funny. and using levity to activate social change or even activate change in their relationships or their organizations? Mm. Well, a couple of different Omri, questions. would you like to tackle that one? Wow, that's, that's a tough one. I, I would steal materials from other comedians that actually know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're I'm, all doing that. No, I'm joking. I agree. Uh, but I just want to add to what your, your comments from before, that um, uh, if to quote another famous person, uh, it's, I feel like it's the uh, spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. the, that kind of using comedy to use those, kind of mental health is such a taboo. Mm -hmm. And to use comedy to break it into the tiny elements that, that build that fear out of that topic and make it kind of like go away because it's kind of like you understand there is some more complicated elements there and some funny light moments that we kind of like will be the gateway to understanding that, that would make a big evolution in the acceptance of the society to that. Uh, so. um, and but, to answer the question, yeah, I would sorry. say knowing your role, mm. like knowing what, we, we always know your audience, if you're going to give a speech, if you're going to put out a report, who are you really trying to reach? Mm. I think you have to know your audience, but you also have to know your role and your strength. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I, one of the things that I want to do now in the inside of a comedy brand is uh, I, I now work with a lot of hilarious people who know how to translate uh, issues in comedic ways, but they don't go deep. They don't, it's not their job to know the ins and outs. So I want to develop really strong partnerships with, mm -hmm. because that was who I used to be, who I still am in, in my heart and core, uh, to brief us, like let us develop a really strong partnership uh, with the universe of organizations that are working on a certain issue, so we can get really smart. Because I don't, I also think that um, you know the com comedian side shouldn't just be writing. What is the goal of the activists of the organizations who are doing the work, mm. so that we can start to create uh, the comedy that drives towards the same uh, endpoint. Mm. But to, to that point, it's also, I, I always say, if you're not a comedian, don't try and be one. Um, if you're going to, you know, don't want, you want to be like your granddad trying to make a joke <laughs> at the beginning of a speech <laughs> at someone's wedding. It's always, it's never going to work. Um, and we all know what that's like. But you were sort of saying, how do you bring that into your own life? It's, it's really, I always say, it's just about being open. You, you talked about partnerships. Those collaborations that you make with people who are funny are going to be vital no matter what it is that you do. Well, there's um, also like, um, just to add to that, I'm sure you know this because you teach about this topic, so I'm excited to meet you. Um, but, uh, you know, there's improv training, of course, which is about how we become funny in our personal selves, but also, like, you know if you're funny already. So that's one <laughs> thing. Um, but uh, the other thing, just to add to what Fenella said and to add to what my colleagues have also said, um, I have this... I have this term, I was trying to explain this in a very wonky way from a research perspective. I was like, nobody, everybody's eyes are glazing over. So now I just say, uh, what we shouldn't be doing is creating what I call conference room comedy. So conference room comedy, we've all been in this meeting. We're sitting around the conference room and someone goes, what's our new public engagement strategy going to be? And someone's like, oh, hey, Fenella's pretty funny. She could write the comedy thing. And then <laughs> Fenella, eager to please, says, um, sure, I'll write the comedy thing. But what we know is that Fenella, while multi-talented, 
is not a comedy <laughs> writer, do not on. let her do it. So, um, so, so this is about collaboration. So stealing, so collaborating with comedians <laughs> is important. So I said this uh, in a podcast interview with an amazing scholar named Henry Jenkins, who created this term civic imagination or whatever. And, uh, and he's real smart and funny, so I was saying the conference. This is just a joke, because it makes me laugh every time. So I said, so, so Henry, we shouldn't be creating conference room comedy. And he goes, oh, so what you're saying is a combination of mansplaining and bad dad jokes is not going to equal social change. <laughs> oh. Because I was about Funny, to tell you a joke, and it was going to be a bad dad joke. Um, okay, we, we want to get through a few more questions, so we'll try and get uh, do quicker answers. Is that okay? Oh, I just Sorry. want to to, yeah. to finish that. <laughs> that failed. <laughs> one last explanation. No, I want to say. I, I mean, we've been to a lot of panels about comedy, trying to dissecting the frog and explaining comedy, yeah. and I was never surrounded by seventy-five percent female. And I got to say, it's not easy to be a minority. Oh, it's not just so there. hard. I so know. <laughs> But I'm Tish. Who does do this? So, okay. the man thing. so yeah. hands up if you have questions, and I want to get through these things really quickly. So let's all try and do quick answers too. So you, sir, and then we'll move over to that. Yep. Hi, I'm Mark Silver from NPR. Uh, Katie, I wanted to interview yes. you in 2015, and I didn't, but now I will when you get back. <laughs> yeah. um, I had two questions. I edited a blog on global health and development called Goats and Soda. Yeah. Um, and I, would, I know, Erica, you said it's not always about the punchlines. It would be really cool to share some punchlines that work. Do you each have an example <laughs> of a joke about a social problem, a knock-knock joke, a riddle, anything that would make people laugh? Oh, my god. And you can think about that for a second. My other question is, as a consumer of comedy, I go home, I watch Seth Meyers, I watch The Daily Show, I watch Stephen Colbert, and I'm so depressed at the end because it breaks that chaotic reality into edible chunks, and I'm like, it's worse than I imagined because I didn't know Donald <laughs> Trump can't even pronounce the word oranges or origin. <laughs> so how do you guard against that over, sort of like over whatever, over sort of sw being swamped by so much political comedy that it ends up depressing you? Mm. Wow. Wow. Uh, I don't have a joke prepared. Again, knowing my role, I'm not, I could, not a comedian, but I'll work on it. I'll go talk to my friends who are, and we'll come back with a really great retort. No, I can, um, I can tell you that I, I do have one liner of Stephen Wright that it always keeps with me. He says that um, the banks want you to trust them with all your money, but they are tying the pen to the table when you are getting to, to see them. I don't remember the exact. <laughs> But it is a punchline, 12 words, the first 10 build you to one direction, the, the last two are kind of like breaking it, but it's kind of like tells you the whole story about your relationship with the economical system. And you kind of like, for a second, you, you rethink all this relationship and it's much more complicated topic that explain to you in one clear, blunt way. Uh, so that's kind of explanation. I, I want to acknowledge, though, that it is heavy. Um, and from a comedy brand side, we actually are planning a new show to come after The Daily Show that will be intended to be a palate cleanser. Because we heard that. We listen to our audience, and we know that you're, you, know, you want to see the issues being astutely criticized and made hilarious. Mm. But you might need something before you go to bed. That said, a lot of people are watching. Yeah. They're watching I, the clips. On, I have on one punchline. We, we haven't got time to play it, but George Pell was Cardinal George Pell in Australia, and he, um, he, you may know, was uh, convicted and, and jailed a couple of weeks ago for for assaulting children, basically. But Tim Minchin, who's a musician and a music comedian, another Australian comedian, uh, basically did a song three years ago that went viral and it hit the charts. It's, it was called Come Home Pell, and the punchline was he had to come home, he had to face the courts, and now he's in jail. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. No, it was actually it's it's an amazing story. It shows you how can comedy generate change. Tim Minchin is a stand-up comedian mm. that is known for those songs that he is doing, and you, you should check out the, the song that he wrote about this person, Cardinal Pell, that generates such a big. Uh, uh, it's massive. It, yeah, that it's actually almost won the Australian uh, mu music chart for that year. Mm. Oh so the God. joke. Yeah, he's a hero in Australia. The, no, Tim yeah. Minchin, sorry. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, Tim we'll go to your question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eli. I'm a student here at Oxford. Um, I really love the Stephen Colbert quote that reality has a well known liberal bias, <laughs> and, which I think is kind of true. But I, what I think is interesting is, you know, comedy is a tool that anyone can use. So obviously, my Trump voting uncle is listening to something and he's laughing about it. So I think we might be kind of sequestered in a world in which we're only seeing a certain brand of comedy. So that's one thing I think it's interesting to discuss. The other thing is, how would we think about using comedy to reach 
people that are from a totally different political or social perspective. Maybe some good examples you have of that, because I think mm -hmm. there's obviously two sides to the politici politicization of comedy. It, yeah. it can be a good thing when you see someone like Michelle Wolf <coughs> give an amazing uh, rendition, and but it can also have uh, repercussions. Oh, can I start on that really quick? Um, I promise I won't make it long. No, no. Uh, so yes, it's a really, really smart and important question. So. Um, a cup, so again, I'll, I'll go back to this idea that w what you're asking is a genre question, which I think is really important. So there is some evidence that when we're talking about issues that are sort of, I call ideologically hijacked in some way, like strong polar opposition on one side or the other, um, that satire is not used at that moment to get people who are on the other side to come with you, right? That's not what sat satire is, a biting form of social critique. Um, but satire is used in that sense to mobilize a base, to um, coalesce identity around issues that you think about. Um, but what kinds of comedy, this is why it's so important for the work that we're doing together and we'll do together and that we write about in this book, is that it is to not stop at political satire because that's a very limited story. And, mm -hmm. and actually, we already know it. There's like a whole lot of research about it, which you probably know because you're a student at Oxford. I feel like you know everything <laughs> if you go to Oxford. Um, but, um, but the kind of comedy, you know, here's a really good example um, that's been written about a number of times by people in the culture change community. And also, there's some social science research around shows that portrayed gay, gay and lesbian characters in the 90s into the early 2000s, all the way up to Modern Family and Glee, all the way up to the Constitutional Right to Marry in 2015. And, uh, and that's a perfect example of that, right? So I, I hate to say humanize, it's so offensive that we have to humanize gay and lesbian people, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but those shows did that. And they reached, and if you look at a show like Modern Family, Modern Family is a big network ABC Disney show. That is not just for one part of America. Mm -hmm. Those characters were beloved. Um, so by the time they got married, America embraced that. You know, that's a, and that's a long, steady, we don't have enough time to get into the sort of long and short game of social change and strategy and all of that, but that's a long, steady ebb and flow of humanity and kindness and light and optimism that's not at all the same thing as political satire. Mm. And actually, you can see in America, most of the social evolutions are being reflected few years before they happened or in comedy. Um, yeah. Mary Tyler Moore show or yes. the um, Bill Cosby, mm -hmm. the, the yeah. first one, the first uh, yeah. round of uh, Bill Cosby and all the, um, I mean, so we're talking about Afro-Americans, mm -hmm. female, gay and lesbian. Mm -hmm. An intersection of marginalized people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, another questions? Oh, just down here, thank you. And then one at the back after that. And you, yes. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm James Logan, I'm from the Fund for Global Human Rights and we are working with activists around the world to integrate comedy in different yep. countries. And so I'm really interested in that. I know you are exploring some of the same things. Mm -hmm. and with your colleague? With my colleague, who's yeah. also called James. Uh -huh. James but, um, uh, and you know, in some countries, for example, there is not a tradition of stand-up comedy. There are you know, very different cultural approaches to how mm -hmm. our comedy is used. Mm -hmm. and actually, I just wanted to pick up on that last point about Bill Cosby, where I think about comedy being used to sort of advance the rights of particular communities, mm -hmm. but then on other issues, that same comedian can be really, really retrograde and really punching down. Right. And so I think of like Dave, Dave Chappelle, for example, you know, who's been so interesting in the States about calling out like, issues around racism and racial discrimination, but then when mm -hmm. he came back two or three years ago, the way he was talking about trans people was just appalling. So mm. creative freedom, but how do you deal with that kind of issue? Yeah. Mm. Katie? Well, uh, you're right to point that out as well. Um, uh, so this is not a complete answer to that, but, and I, I know uh, Omria will have a real perspective on this as a comedy writer, but A, m most comedy is funny when it punches up, not down, so we know that, but then yes, there, um, there are the kinds of issues that you spoke about. But, so the incomplete answer, but I think it's really important to acknowledge, is that because the marketplace is shifting so much, the marketplace is changing this dynamic a lot, right? So I use Hassan Minaj as a, an example a lot. Um, I produced a documentary about him four years ago before he was on The Daily Show, and uh, so I've followed his work very closely. Hassan is such a great example of what I mean by 
the marketplace is shifting around truly embracing voices that have been traditionally marginalized to squeeze out that other stuff. So Hassan, um, if you all watch Patriot Act on Netflix, I've now promoted it twice. Um, you know, I asked Hassan for my book. I interviewed all these comedy people and justice leaders and whatever. And um, I said, so how are you coming up with your topics? And if you know what he's doing, he's doing, you know, he's, he's a lot of justice topics. And he said something to the effect of, look, if you're a white comedy person, if you, Katie, did a story on affirmative action, no matter how you do that story, no matter how much you're well-meaning, it's going to sound like a book report. Because mm. you don't really know, and I don't. But he said, but I'm a brown man in America. I'm going to do a story about affirmative action that's going to feel and look totally different. So that is cultural citizenship. That is a full embracing, not assimilating into some version that's palatable in a sort of marketplace that's dominated by particular gatekeepers. And he's not the only one. There's, so I think that, um, that there, there is a, a calling out of the comedy that you're talking about. like like that, even within the last five years. And so I think that is starting to happen in ways that are kind of organic, but not entirely organic, because the media landscape has shifted so much. Mm, mm. Excellent. Um, there's a question here, thank you, and then there afterwards. Um, thanks, my name is Tara Lloyd. I lead an organization in Madagascar called Pivot. And I just wanted to build on this sort of idea of activating your funny and ask Erica a question. Um, which is that I think maybe for a lot of us, at least I was like drawn to come to this um, room today because I thought, wow, I remember like a long time ago being kind of funny or relatable. And now my work is so heavy that mm. I feel like I like repel my closest friends and neighbors who don't want to ask me how my day was because I might say plague or something else yeah. like horrific. And the thing that I'd like to come away from this thinking about this like intersection of social justice and comedy is how do we not lose ourselves in our work? Mm. but Mm. be relatable. Like sometimes I think the closest that my friends and family get to Madagascar is that moment that they ask me about my last trip or my work. Mm. And I, I feel so afraid of trying to make light of it. And it also doesn't feel light. I don't feel light and funny anymore. Mm. And it's just kind of like an interesting thing yeah. to me to think about. Mm. Is there a way to find your way back to that? So even as we lead our organizations and live our personal lives, we're like still able to bring that home. Yeah. I, do you have advice? Comedy <laughs> is self-care in addition to, you know, all of the benefits of using it to do your work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before we did the project, um, What Could Go Wrong, I focused on open carry in the United States. It, my, and the organization's life was in following shootings and working when, with gun violence survivors and you know, taking on the NRA, all of this stuff was super hard. Um, and I also didn't feel like I was doing the, had a, um, the light in my work. Um, but I think the point about comedy uh, being an avenue to hope and optimism um, is, is that if you're doing the broad, all of the things that social justice, NGO, organi it, the, that part of the work, you, you, do the, you have to do the serious stuff. You have to advocate. You have to do the research. You have to engage mm -hmm. people in, in those serious ways. Uh, but the, that if you can find a comedic way in, it's, it's, the, um, it's the catch point. Um, and so being fun, be, finding a way to be funny about a serious topic, like too, way too many people dying of gun violence in our country, um, was a way to also, you know, go and socialize with friends. And I'll be like, oh, but you got to check out this. Uh, we're experimenting with comedy or the arts or uh, bringing together other cultural institutions to talk about the issue in a way that isn't just how many people are being killed every day in our country, which is heavy. Can I offer two quick tactical things? I swear I'll be really short. Uh, so <laughs> Ai Jin Poo, how she's using comedy, um, she's working with Second City. And Second City is doing a comedy improv training with domestic workers who are actually the ones who are telling their stories, which actually create policy change. So it's a way of, because they realize, you know, they realize doing the work that they're, you know, we all have funny stories. Humans are funny. Dealing with messy humans is funny. So they wanted to harness the, the funny stories that they had to tell and also 
um, provide a, a bit of extra training as they tell their advocacy stories. So that's like a direct example. And the other one that's uh, really interesting, there's a group called Define American. Um, it's actually part of our lab. Uh, Define American deals with um, humanizing immigration issues and, and stories in the United States. And, and something that they do I think is fascinating. So they work with Hollywood and advise on shows to um, you know, like if you're going to tell a story about an immigrant, here's what you should do, or somebody who's undocumented. And um, so the woman who runs cultural strategy there, Elizabeth Voorhees, said, you know, even when we go into the room to advise on a serious show, like Grey's Anatomy or something, uh, we bring comedy people with us. We bring um, uh, often undocumented comedians because we find that if we don't do that, automatically in the room, we're all sad, and we can't get people back from that. We can't get TV writers back from it, so even when they're doing a series. Mm. So it just opens up this space for humanity that's like, we're all a little bit funny because we're mm. human. Get everybody uh, in the room, basically. Yeah, yeah, and you're not like, oh, mm. you know, my, yeah, yeah, anyway. Okay, so we had a question just here, and then one at the back as well. So you've been waiting a little while, so. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is LJ Silverman and I head up social entrepreneurship at the London School of Economics and I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. I think um, as a Brit we can actually learn quite a bit from, from the Americans on this. Um, what I've noted through the whole Brexit um, debacle is that um, comedy has been used quite a bit. So on the People's March um, the other week there were, there were loads of um, placards, Alexa cancel Brexit, where Brits run a march, things must be bad, those kind of things. And um, But I think from... From what I've, what, have I, what I've experienced and from speaking with friends, it is very much an echo chamber um, in Britain at the moment. And um, when I talk to the few friends that did vote Brexit, they haven't seen the funny placards and they haven't, they haven't, um, haven't been watching Have I Got News For You. Mm. Um, and I do feel that for us, yes, it's a comfort blanket is getting through what is a pretty awful divorce um, at the moment. But I, I somehow feel there must be a way of getting across, and I know that satire, as you as you said, doesn't doesn't work. But on a practical level, how can we um, engage more? Because I feel that it's dividing. Comedy can be more divisive at the moment, especially mm. in the UK, than kind of productive and, and encouraging and accelerating social change. So on a kind of day-to-day -day level, on a practical level, on the digital platforms, what do you think we can be doing to get the message across and to change minds rather than just to mm. polarise even more? Omri, do you want to have uh, an answer to this? Just to look at the time as well. So. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, so we'll one more question after this. I, I haven't found a way to reach out to the other aisle with comedy and kind of like, I'm, I'm honest, honest here, I, I never really found a way to convince people by using comedy, but I found it very powerful to engage the, the a chance for hope by kind of like my own uh, peer of friends, otherwise we'll be completely uh, uh, depressed. Uh, since we have only one minute and a half and it's kind of like the end, I want to tell you, but I think there is a story that might be helpful here. Um, back in the six, early 60s, Karl Reiner, uh, the legendary writer Karl Reiner was sitting in his office and actually maybe a good answer for your question about how to become funny and what funny is. So Karl Reiner, the best writer I know, yeah. is now 90 something, was sitting in his office on the 40th floor at, at NBC and he was writing the Dick Van Dyke show, the most popular comedy show at the time. And the 25-year-old executive from the network came over to his office <laughs> and put his foot on his Karl Reiner's desk and told him, let me tell you what is funny. And gave Karl Reiner a 10 minutes conversation about him, um, a talk about what funny is. After 10 minutes, Karl Reiner was like, have you done? And the executive was like, yeah. So Karl Reiner took the shoe of this executive leg and threw it out of the window and said, this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't really explain how to do that, but I guess that would be, yeah, you just need to show it. Like we have a saying in Israel that uh, pornography is a matter of geography. Comedy is also a matter of cultural elements and stuff, but, uh, but basically on the bottom line, it's all getting into understanding what makes people laugh and it's mm. trying to work with that. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have one more question. Thank you. Bunker Roy from uh, India. This is my 15th year in this forum. And I was just wondering why we have 80% of the speakers who are so deadly dull. <laughs> why is it we don't have many more people who speak about humor, about comedy, and make the very serious issues a bit more lighter? We need we more funding. To. Sorry? And then, and then there will be more. Do you mean of us. funding, like funding? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Stay all night. You but I just want to quick. say <laughs> that since I've been working in India for the last few months, I became a big fan of Indian comedy. I know it's weird. Oh, yeah. It's not very... Uh, so why can't we have a session next year on comedians and people who have humor from the South? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's addressed to Jude right there, sitting in front. Sounds good. You got it, Jude? Can <laughs> Jude's doing yeah, it, we're writing it down. Well, um, can we have many, many more sessions like this? Because it's very important. This is the first session I've had. I don't know if this is the first session you've ever had in the last 15 years, Jude, <laughs> on humor, yeah. on comedy. No. And I think one in 2015. Perhaps I was forgettable in 2015. You may not remember <laughs> that I said similar things. But well, now, just with more words. So the, the point many is, more sessions like this next more year. More culture change, more cultural elements. Well, this is an opportunity to say when you vote, you should check off five. More of it. So, shall we have a hands up? Who would like more sessions like this in the future uh, at Skull? Yes. <laughs> Who would like to have more comedy conversations happening in your workplace? In, okay, Ooh. who is now willing to go back and work with comedians, comedy writers to start the conversation in your organisations? Yes? Do you want the Laughter Lab in your region? Yes. Because we're trying to get funding for that. Um, <laughs> so it's about, I mean, really, really, just to wrap up, it is actually about, it's about literally embracing what the possibilities can do, the art of persuasion using comedy. That's what it's all about. Uh, I was going to get you guys to all finish with a quick joke, but, you, you know, I haven't prepared you, so... We'll just have to leave it at that. What did the zero say to the eight? Nice belt. Mm -hmm. I say that all the time. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <It's very laughs> okay, um, it's been wonderful having you guys here for this incredible <laughs> session. And could you please thank our incredible speakers, Katie, Omri, and Erica. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>